Hi and welcome to True Crime with Emma Kenny. Tonight I'm going to be talking about Eileen Wernos, but before I start, make sure if you're here for the first time that you subscribe because then you'll be able to see when a new video comes out. I do these videos every single Sunday. Today I'm going to be talking about a case that I find really conflicting and I always have. Eileen Wernos is somebody that I have known about for many, many, many years. I've read her book, I've watched every documentary that there is about her, and I still feel exactly the same. It doesn't matter how much new information comes out, I still have this huge conflict within me. Because this is one of the few cases where I have a level of empathy, even at the end, for the killer. I'd really like to know what your thoughts are about this. You might completely disagree. You might think that she deserved to end the way that she deserved, or you may agree that maybe this is a case where a serial killer really was created. So what actually happened to Eileen? And what was the reason that she was eventually brought to justice? You know, this case sticks in my throat a little because I don't believe that the criminally insane should ever be put to death, for good reason. Because if you're criminally insane, you can't be compass mentis, you can't be in charge of your faculties. The way that you act cannot be dealt with in the way that it would, should you have sanity. Without doubt, I believe that Eileen Wernos was most definitely insane when she was given a lethal injection. So this story, to me, is sad for a million reasons. Of course, one of the main reasons is that seven men died unnecessarily. The vast majority of these men were completely innocent human beings. But you know, there was a time when Eileen was also completely innocent. And the question is, if her life had been kinder, would she have become one of the world's most infamous serial killers? I'd love to hear how you guys feel about this. She was born on the 29th of February, 1956, and she endured what I believe is one of the most nightmarish childhoods that any child could experience. It was filled with instability, sexual abuse, and intensely challenging homelessness. You know, that's not justifying for one minute what Wernos ended up becoming but it offers a really compelling explanation for why she turned to prostitution and violence later in life. Over the course of one year, between 1989 and 1990, Wernos killed seven men before being arrested a year later and then sentenced to death in 2002. That makes her, as far as history is concerned, one of the most prolific female serial killers. Let's just look at what form this woman. Because I know that I always talk about the fact that there are genetics, and there is obviously the fact that some people will be born, I believe, with a predisposition to do harm. But there's also nurture. And I think that nurture is a really powerful, powerful motivator behind certain types of behavior. And whilst we don't like to talk about criminals also being victims, very often criminals are themselves victims of quite tragic abuse and treatment. Wernus's mother was known as Diane Wernus. She was 15 or around 16 when she gave birth to her. Her father was a couple of years older, they were teenagers. Now Diane abandoned Wernus and her brother Keith when she was four years old. It's really young. One of the things about abandonment is it leaves children with so many questions. What was wrong with them? Why weren't they loved? What could they have done better? The insecurity that those attachment issues can create can mean that relationships for the rest of somebody's life can be fractured. And that's before we add all the other ingredients that I'm gonna talk about shortly. But for Eileen, it was a really tough beginning. Wernus's father, Dale Pittman, was actually in prison when she was born. He'd been convicted of sex crimes against children. So we already know that we have a problem with parentage without a doubt. On one side, we have an abandoning parent. On the other, we have a predator 
he also was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He actually hanged himself in his jail cell in 1969 when Eileen Wernus was a teenager. In fact, there is some reports that he was strangled, he was murdered, but it tends to be told that he hung himself in a jail cell. So I've given you both of those because from the research that I've done, it tends to be that it suggested that he killed himself, but there are other stories which slightly differ from this. Imagine being a young girl growing up in poverty, knowing that your father had gone to prison for sex crimes and knowing that your mother hadn't wanted you. It's a really challenging experience. Who do you turn to? Who loves you how you need to be loved? Where do you get your attention from? In fact, probably the closest relationship that Eileen had was with her brother Keith. Lots of people recall that when they knew Eileen as a child, she was often very cold, she was very hungry, she was desperate to get money. And from a really, really young age, and I'm talking oh, a really, really devastatingly young age, she would have sex with boys for comfort or to be included. People said sometimes she had quite problematic social skills, she struggled to fit in. Or sometimes she'd do it just to buy cigarettes or food. That's something that I find really hard to process. You know, the idea that a really young child, you know, so young that it suggested she was about 10 or 11 years old at the time that she carried out these kind of beginnings of sexual activity. No child, no child is prepared for this kind of behavior, nor ready for the impact of that kind of sexualized behavior at such a young age. It's really terrifying. Think about it. Think about the 10 and 11 year olds that you know. And then think about that 10 and 11 year old being raped because a child cannot consent to have sex. She was being raped persistently, constantly throughout her childhood. And this is by the age of 11. One of the problems that lots of abused children have is that sex becomes something that they associate with shame they associate with guilt, they feel used, unloved, throw away, they feel that their bodies do not really belong to them, they belong to others. And the behaviours that we see develop with this create a huge amount of confusion. Eileen spent her whole childhood being abused, hungry, lonely, all of the things that is the very opposite of what we want to create for a healthy, happy adult. One of the really challenging things that's also been said, and she said it herself, is that her brother would also have sex with her. And it was almost seen as a joke. It was known by local people. And he even engaged in this idea that anybody could use her. So Eileen Wernos grew up being treated like a piece of rubbish. A young girl, a child, fitting in nowhere, used by anyone. Another one of the claims that she's made is that her own grandfather sexually abused her and beat her up. And when she was 14, and this is categorically correct, Wernus was raped by a friend of her grandfather who knew that was happening so he knew that she was being raped by him and she became pregnant. She was 14 and at that point she was sent to a home for young girls. She became a ward of the state and it was so traumatising for her. She really struggled with social skills as we know from her childhood. She didn't feel like she fitted in and she also recalled at the time that the staff made her feel really lonely. She felt unwanted and she gave birth the following year to a boy and put the child up for adoption. So we are talking, at 15 years of age, she's gone through abandonment, she's gone through the suicide of her father, knowing that her father's a predator. She's been used and abused by her brother, her grandfather, impregnated, knowingly as far as abuse was concerned, by her grandfather's friend, domestically abused, used by people in the local area all by the age of 15. And finally, she's even had to give up a child for adoption. 
when she returned to her granddad's after she left the home, something that would have obviously been traumatic in itself, she literally lasted a couple of months there. And then she dropped out of school and he washed his hands of her. The man who'd abused her, the man who had allowed a friend of his to molest her, literally threw her onto the streets with absolutely nothing. Now, I always wonder at this point in Eileen's life, how did men represent in her thinking? You know, this older man, her grandfather, who rejected her, abandoned her, abused her. What was she thinking about forming those ideas regarding power and control? Where was the rage beginning? Because I'd have been rageful. If I'd spent my entire childhood being treated so dreadfully, I'd be rageful. And if so many boys and men had used me and abused me and shamed me and made me feel like I was worth nothing, how would I feel about the world at large and how would I feel about the men around me? Now again, this isn't going to give any excuses to Eileen Wernos, but I'm saying that when we start to look at what forms a killer, not all stories are equal. Now, after she's been made homeless, it's tragic. She drifts around. She even sleeps in an old car in the woods and in the woods themselves. Imagine how you are dealing with that at that age. How scary would that be? She didn't have any money, any security, any sanctuary, any safety. She starts getting in trouble around 18 years of age with the authorities. So she gets involved with the police, petty crime, disorderly behavior. She's seen shooting a gun from a car. Now, that is obviously very bad behavior, but it also gives us an insight into a couple of key concerns in my opinion. Firstly, she has got unsurprisingly low boundaries because of her experiences previously. And she's obviously not afraid of guns. She's carrying one. Now in the States, that's legal but the behavior of her use around that firearm is unacceptable. And we are starting to see some really concerning traits in her behavior. She's prostituting herself again because this is how she makes money to eat. And we have to remember that. Eileen's in a situation where she does need to eat. She does need to be able to live. So therefore she's turning tricks to make money in a way that can fund that lifestyle. And it's not a great lifestyle. It's a terrible lifestyle, but it's better than starving. Now, there is a really bright spot, a tiny momentary bright spot in Eileen Wernus's dark history. And that's when she starts hitchhiking and she actually ends up in Florida. And she meets and has a brief union with a really wealthy yacht club owner called Lewis Fell. He was 69 when they got married. Now, you know, the nuptials were even printed in the society pages. This is a real moment for her. However, really quickly after he annuls the marriage and he files a restraining order against her because she attacks him with his cane. This stands out for me, it really does. Because this would have been where everything could have changed. You know, this was a lucky break, right? This should have been an opportunity to have a lavish lifestyle, to be loved, no doubt to come into an inheritance and her whole world could have shifted. You know, she could have been a girl who'd had a terrible history but actually it ended up living a luxury lifestyle, being loved by somebody older than her, yes, but a man who could take care of her and protect her. I wish to some degree that she'd stayed married to him because Eileen's life would have been so different. Now we have to acknowledge that the reason that this marriage ended was because of her violence. We're introduced to her violence at this point. She's got a great deal of rage. She has a high capacity for harm. She beats her husband up and it shows that she has that tenacity within her. And the fact that she beats her husband up shows that she's got a tenacity to do great harm. The marriage literally lasted weeks. And pretty soon after, we see that there is a decline in her behavior and there is an extensive increase in the amount of arrests that she goes through. She gets a lot of assaults against her, all towards men. Again, her anger, her aggression directed towards men. What is that saying about the internalized feelings that she has about the opposite sex? 
The same year, in 1974, that she ends her marriage, or has her marriage ended, her brother Keith dies of esophageal cancer, and she gets 10 grand, $10,000 from his life insurance. Now, even though her marriage has ended, this $10,000 is a huge amount of money. And she manages to pay off the fines that she's got for being criminal. She manages to get herself in a situation where she's got expendable income. And within two months, she spends that $10,000. She buys luxuries like a new car, which she wrecks pretty much shortly after. She buys jewellery, you know, all the fine things in life. And this shows a really chaotic behaviour pattern. $10,000 in the 1970s was a lot of money. In fact, I looked it up. She could have bought a house in a decent spot outright and still had change. You see, this living hard and fast, it suggests that Eileen wasn't thinking ahead. And she has a destructive side to her nature. You know, maybe she felt that she had something to prove to all those people who treated her so badly before. Or maybe she didn't think about the future because she simply didn't believe that she had one. Who knows? People who throw themselves under the bus, in my opinion, in this way, they're often struggling with their mental health. And without doubt, that girl, that woman, had endured enough pain, rape, trauma, and abandonment to exacerbate any mental health issues. We also know that her father was schizophrenic, and this does have the potential to run in families. So, was some of her behaviour linked to this? Without a doubt, what you can say is that she is likely to have been mentally unstable. And I imagine even then, she would have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. But was there something even deeper going on? In fact, I think if a psychologist was challenged to invent a childhood that would predictably produce a serial killer, Wernus's life would have been it to the last detail. Now her charge sheets over the years kept growing and growing. You know, these went from petty theft to grand theft auto and even armed robbery. She was in and out of prison, which I genuinely imagine wouldn't have been such a bad place for her. She would have been clean, she would have been fed, warm, three meals a day, and she definitely wouldn't have had to sleep with strangers to survive. You see, that's one of the things that I think people miss about being in a system. If your life outside is incredibly challenging, then life on the inside is hardly going to be a deterrent. Actually, it would be more positive to be there. Another important issue to consider is that she did many of these crimes alone, and that makes her stand out. Because whilst women absolutely do offend, hands held up, they are definitely offend, they kill, they maim, they steal, they con, of course, this level of violence is still relatively rare. So, we're once again introduced into Eileen's extreme and without boundaries behaviour. Like with any offending, when you see escalations, and dramatic escalations in this case, you can almost predict that it's not going to reduce without some pretty severe consequences. And that's what we see with Eileen. Throughout all of her life, from being a very, very young child, what we know is she was a prostitute. This is something that she started making money from when she was very, very young, and she continued all the way up until her arrest. In 1986, Eileen was arrested by one of her customers. He told the police that she'd pulled a gun on him and demanded money. Now, I think this is a really pivotal moment for her because she's got so much rage within her, but she also sees herself as a victim. She always has, and she always has been. I am the first person to say I have complete horror when I view what happened to her, how badly she was let down, how awfully she was abused. She was definitely a victim. But she also sees that she's a victim when she's committing crime. And the fact that a punter actually tells the police and makes himself the victim is probably going to have really infuriated her. She must have had so much rage towards men within her that this potentially could be her tipping point. Is this her tipping point? Is this the point where she thinks, well, I'm not gonna leave a victim with the opportunity to tell the police that I've robbed them? Prostitutes on average, just to put this in perspective, and it's really important that I do this, prostitutes on average have been raped 
more than five times during their career. I mean, imagine the impact of one rape. Imagine how you would feel if somebody that you knew had been raped or if you had been raped. And then times that by a minimum of five. And Eileen worked in areas that, that were really problematic. She didn't turn tricks for a lot of money. So she probably had a higher than average impact of being raped. How would that make her feel about men? Now, how would you feel if that had happened to you? How would you change your view towards the individuals or the gender of the individuals who'd done that? And how does that compound those fractures that were already part of Eileen's story? Now, another point where Eileen Wernus's life changes and shifts is when she meets Tyria or Ty. She meets her at a Florida biker bar in June 1986. And at the time, Ty was 24 years old and worked as a hotel maid. And one of the things that Ty said was that she was there alone, I was there alone. We started a conversation, we went home, we spent the weekend together and we became a couple. This was intense. And I think that it was probably the first time that Eileen Werner started to feel love. And I definitely think that she was capable of feeling love. And I think that's another important thing to remember. This is not a woman devoid of emotion. In fact, I sometimes wonder whether Eileen was so full of emotion, so full of overwhelming feelings that she constantly felt extremes. Add to that the later diagnosis of BPD and antisocial behaviour personality disorder, and she would emotionally have these very, very extreme emotional experiences. And also, let's remember that BPD in particular is linked to trauma, and boy, this woman had had more than her fair share of trauma by the age of 11, let alone as an adult. In Thai, Eileen found somebody really special. She's in love. She became the absolute center of the universe and their relationship lasted in total four years. They lived in cheap motels and trailers and they even actually lived in the woods together a couple of times. And it was Eileen Wernus's job as far as she saw to support them. She supported them financially through her prostitution on the Florida highways. And that was a dangerous job to have. Now, Ty did not like that. She didn't approve of her work. When she found out she was a prostitute, she tried to do everything in her words that she could do to stop her doing it. She didn't think it was safe. And she genuinely said that she cared about her. But whatever the reasons, she didn't give it up. I have to say, personally, I think Ty probably has some rose-coloured spectacles on her own behaviour because, with respect, she did let her carry on and she did live on the profits, so she benefited. And despite those disagreeing about that particular area of their relationship, they really did stay close. And Eileen wanted Ty to get married to her. She liked providing for her. When they were at home together, they'd just chill, they'd watch TV, drink in bars. The one thing that we do know is that Eileen was the more dominant one. And often when they were out, Eileen Wernus would get into altercations with other men in particular. By 1987 to 1988, she was questioned by police at least three times for hitting a man with a beer bottle, vandalizing her own apartment, although Ty joined in, and also making threatening phone calls to a supermarket. So again, we are seeing This chaos, this descent into violence and this further unravelling, so to speak. On November the 30th, 1989, the killing begins. Eileen Wernos shoots and kills Richard Mallory. Now, he's a man that she claims tried to rape her and she doesn't just kill him, she then takes his goods, robs him, and drives home using Mallory's Cadillac. And she actually tells Tyria that she's carried out the murder. Now, before we condemn Eileen Wernus about this murder, I think we need to look at Richard Mallory. So he was the owner of Clearwater, which was a Florida electronics repair business. He was 51, and his only constants in life were alcohol, sex, and paranoia. He was known by people who knew him well to go missing for days so he wouldn't show up to work. And that meant that when he didn't show up 
for work after she'd killed him. It wasn't really a big deal. And it wasn't until his 1977 Cadillac was found a few days later outside Daytona that anyone even knew that he'd been missing. Now, on December 13th, 1989, two young men were looking for scrap metal along a dirt road close to Interstate 95 in the Volusia County, Florida, and they found a body wrapped in a rubber-backed carpet runner. They call the police and the investigation starts. They carefully take fingerprints of this guy wrapped in a carpet runner and the fingerprints identify that this was Richard Mallory's body. He'd been last seen 13 days earlier, but when they found his body, he'd been shot three times with a 22 calibre gun. Months and months of investigations led to absolutely no leads. And part of this was to do with the initial suspicion was that a stripper called Chastity had told a boyfriend that she had gone to a party with Richard Mallory earlier and that she was the one who'd killed him. So the investigators actually arrested this woman called Chastity only to realise that her confession was basically just in an argument when she was trying to scare her boyfriend. And because of these dead ends, Mallory's case was eventually cold. Now, I do believe, honestly, personally, that this first kill of Eileen Wernos was in self-defense. You may disagree with me. I would love to know what you think. This is just me, personally. Because I know his MO, because I know his history, I do feel that there is a strong possibility that Eileen Wernos acted in self-defense. He was a rapist. And Eileen, we already know, was in a really fragile state. Maybe she enjoyed the power in that moment, taking his life. Maybe she finally had an outlet for all that rage that she felt towards all the men who'd ever harmed her. You know, who knows? Maybe on this occasion, the guy actually got what he deserved. But did she call the police? You know, did she scream rape and admit she killed him in self-defense? No. Of course, Maybe that's because she didn't trust the authorities. After all, she'd been horribly let down by the system through her early years. But no matter what, this doesn't excuse her crime. And from this point on, in my opinion, she goes from victim to predator. After this murder, Eileen Wernos goes back, meets Tyria and tells her what she's done. And Tyria tells Eileen that she doesn't want to know any more about it. She doesn't want to see it, hear it, be aware of it. But we have to remember Tyra was more than happy to profit from the killings. Now, this is when it really escalates. Because the following year, Eileen Wernus kills more men, shooting them, stealing their belongings. And Ty's suspicions are growing because Eileen brings home more and more stolen items and she refuses to listen when Eileen tries to tell her where she gets them from because she feels that if she gets told all this information, she's gonna to have to call the police. I'm gonna call that into question. I think Tyria, or Ty as she was known, did know that Eileen was murdering people. You don't just turn up with people's robbed and stolen items, do you? I mean, she already knows that she's killed before. Why would she suddenly believe that all these things were turning up? but that she was innocent of knowing where they came from. And like I said, if she'd been so bothered about the prostitution, the lack of safety, the potential psychopath that she was living with, maybe she would have put a stop to it by just calling the police. But no, Ty doesn't do that. She just carries on regardless and obviously enjoys the spoils of the crime. Another piece of anecdotal evidence that comes from Tyria or Ty as she's known is that Eileen starts to become more and more angry and unstable. Now, Ty doesn't feel threatened by her because she believes that when Eileen Werner says that she's not going to hurt her, she absolutely feels protected by her, that that's true. But she does start to worry what would happen if she betrayed her, which is understandable because she already knows that her girlfriend has murdered people or at least one person. They've fallen into this bizarre relationship together, pawning stolen belongings of murdered men for cash, driving their cars around. And I feel that that demonstrates how chaotic Eileen Wernos was. I mean, who literally drives around in the car of murder victims that police are looking for? I mean, that's why they get caught. But what is that saying about Eileen Wernos's mental state? She's clearly not calculating. She's not thinking things through, is she? 
She's reacting. She's trying to live a lifestyle by any means without thinking about the consequences. Eileen was not a sophisticated killer. She left evidence that was so easy to lead back to her. As far as I'm concerned, this is the unraveling mentally, emotionally, socially and physically of Eileen Wernos. Another thing that's really interesting about this case is unlike most female serial killers who often kill by strangulation, poisoning or with less automatic methods, Wernus's weapon of choice was a 22 caliber pistol throughout. She was somebody who shot and left. She wasn't an individual who enjoyed torturing, molesting and so on and so forth. This was calculated, almost like a hitman type of experience. In May 1990, Eileen Wernos killed 43-year-old David Spears. She shot him six times. She stripped his corpse naked and five days after Spears' body was discovered, police found the remains of 40-year-old Charles Carscadden, who'd been shot nine times and tossed on the side of the road. Nine times. That's not shooting to kill, that's overkill. What's going on when she's doing that? That's carrying on shooting long after that person. Could even resist and was most likely dead. Again, this bubbling of uncontrollable rage. Every single bullet, what is she thinking of? Who is she imagining shooting in her head? On June 30th, 1990, 65-year-old Peter Seams disappears on a drive from Florida to Arkansas. Now, witnesses later claim to have seen two women matching Tyria and Eileen Wernos. Their descriptions were fitted to the vehicle that they were looking for. And actually, the fingerprints were recovered from that car and several of Siam's personal effects turned up in local pawn shops, which mean that obviously the police are now hot on the trail. Now, Eileen actually manages to go on to kill another three men before she's picked up. In spite of all the evidence, in spite of the fingerprints, in spite of the cars, the belongings, the pawn shops, it's only when she gets into a fight at a biker bar in Volusia that she's brought to justice. Now, as soon as Eileen Wernos is arrested by the police, Tyria flees back to Pennsylvania, which makes good sense because she knows what's coming, but the police actually reprehend her a day after Eileen Wernos is booked. And this is really painful because what happens next, even though it might be considered the right thing to do as far as Tyria speaking to the police, but I also wonder how complicit she was in the actions and how she basically saved her own bacon by doing whatever she needed to bring Eileen down so that she stayed free. I really don't believe at any point when I'm talking about this that Eileen's behaviour was or is any way defensible. But it kind of breaks my heart that the woman that she loved, the woman that she would literally have killed for, betrayed her instantly. She didn't just tell the police about Eileen's crimes, she set her up by calling her and getting her to confess everything. Really, really clearly, incrementally going through everything. Trying to convince Eileen Wernos that if she didn't tell Tyria this, that Tyria thought that she might get implicated and she just wanted to make sure that Eileen was going to be telling the story as it was meant to be told. But obviously it was all recorded. This must have been the absolute ultimate betrayal. And I think that was probably out of everything, the one thing that Eileen Wernos struggled with hugely. I've actually read Monster, which is an autobiography written by Eileen, and I can guarantee you that biased as this might be, the one thing is so clear. Eileen Wernos did know how to love. Yes, she was absolutely a very dangerous woman, but she certainly wasn't devoid of feelings. And that's something that I have to admit many serial killers have been noted to be. The press called her the damsel of death. The damsel of death. During her trial, Eileen Wernus was seen to be remorseless and angry. I don't agree with that. I think she looked manic, panicked, rageful, yes, but also as if she felt gagged that there was so much that she wanted to say and she couldn't say it. She was convicted and given six death sentences. Is it just me who thinks that 
one would be enough. I always get confused about that. I'm going to kill you six times. Not going to happen, is it? Not going to happen. But for some reason, we like to do this. We like to not only kill them, but know that if they had managed not to be killed at that point, then we got another five attempts to do it. Maybe they'd like to bring her back and do it again. I don't know. Wernos found that verdict and started screaming absolutely screaming at the jury. She called the jurors scumbags. She warned the judge that she would kill again. She said, everything they said about me is so full of lying. That's what she said after the trial. It wasn't funny. None of the stuff that they said I did is true. I'm sane. I didn't do drugs. She talks about it just being this sensationalized story. And I have to be honest, she wasn't far wrong with that because pretty much everybody who came into contact with her from her awful awful lawyer who raked in money, used her, sold stories about her, all the way through to police officers who were meant to be dealing with this, made money from her story. It was retold in three movies, two books, a comic book, and this is going to make you giggle, it was even set to music in an opera. Wernus's final statement was quick. It took her 30 seconds and she said, I'd just like to say I am sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus, June the 6th. Like the movie, Big Mothership and all, I'll be back. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't sound like somebody who's sane, does it? It's not somebody who seems like they're compass mentis. She's saying that she's gonna rise from the dead and she's talking in a way that really isn't sensical. Again, the thing about the death sentence is, it should only ever be used when somebody is sane. Eileen Wernus was put to death by lethal injection and she was pronounced dead at 9.47 a.m. That was six minutes after the injection process began. One of the things that we have to say about Eileen Wernus is she wanted to die. She felt like she wanted to make that choice. Appeals were made on her behalf, and while some of them were turned down, what those involved were saying that she was not in a fit state to be put to death, that she was insane. She wasn't even competent enough for her execution. But she absolutely fought to be put to death. Now, one of the things that kind of gets me about the Eileen Wernos case, apart from the fact that she had this awful history, is the way that she's referred to in the press you know, she wasn't America's first female serial killer. Women have been murdering serially for as long as men, though the victims are usually family members or acquaintances, and they most often choose things like poison or the means of disposal. Wernos did kill strangers with a gun, an unusual but not unprecedented fact, but the media went crazy on it. And also, when you think about the way everything was exaggerated and taken at fact. So she said that she'd slept with 250,000 men and that was reported as truth. That would mean that she would have needed to sleep with 35 men a day for 20 years. Like nobody has that stamina. Nobody can plan that many things, and that would literally be a record-breaking performance. But again, this is a story that was told. But most of this is told because of mental illness, not because of reality of experience. Wernos spent a decade on death row. A decade. And during that time, Everybody was fascinated in her. I'm sure that some of you will have seen Charlize Theron playing her. It was an amazing portrayal, amazing portrayal. People wanted to know. They were fascinated by her case because she was a rare example of a female serial killer. Even a 1992 low budget TV movie was made about it. And there were so many news articles written about her, all conflicting. Even when you do the research on her, there's so many conflicting areas. The year after her conviction, one of the things that I watched and that kind of really got me interested in Eileen Wernus' case, and I suppose some of the empathy and sympathy that I have with her, was a documentary by filmmaker Nick Broomfield, a very well-known documentary maker in the UK. The film shone a light both on Wernus' twisted personality to some degree, explored a really tragic backstory, but also pointed out how the justice system seemed more interested in ensuring that she'd get the death penalty instead of considering her disturbed mental state. 
Now, a second film that he did, again, one I watched the minute it came out, was titled Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer. It followed her as she became more and more unhinged throughout a failed last minute trial to vacate her death sentence. And he was actually interviewing her up to the day before her execution on October the 9th, 2002. I would really encourage you to look at those documentaries, particularly the second one, because I felt devastated when I watched her. I can still in my head see the last words that she speaks to him as she's taken away. And I will never forget it because all I could imagine was, no, this isn't right, this is wrong. She is seriously, seriously insane. Throughout the documentaries, Wernos seems to be both terrifying and at the same time pitiful. She justifies the fact that she was fighting back against men who had abused her. Sometimes she'd accept the fate, you know, that she was going to be put to death. And then other times she'd say that she was unjustly victimised. There was a real, real extreme to the way that she would deal with it on a daily basis. And if you've only ever seen films like Monster, where Charlize Theron plays an incredible, incredible portrayal of Eileen Wernos, the reality is that her story was far more complicated. And even though the word monster is used, because of course it's monstrous, to kill innocent men. And most of the men that she killed, they were innocent. In fact, on one occasion, it was somebody desperately trying to help her to give her a better opportunity. But nonetheless, she killed him. She is deserving to have gone to prison for a very long time. But you cannot deny the repeated abuse, the exploitation. One of the things that really sticks with me from Broomfield's film is when she says, a raped woman got executed and was used for books and movies and shit. And I have to agree. Because despite how awful the crimes were, you can't help, you can't help. And you can tell me differently. Please tell me if you feel differently. But I can't help but feel that every single one of those deaths could have been prevented if Eileen Werners had gotten some help at some point in her life. On October the 9th, 2002, prostitute Eileen Carol Wernos, as they reported, was executed by lethal injection for killing seven men in Florida. She didn't even have a last meal, she said no. She just wanted a cup of coffee. Her final words before dying were, yes, I would just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus. June 6th, like the movie, big mothership and all. I'll be back. I'll be back. I mean, is it just me who feels that they are not the words of a sane woman? Think about it. Yes, I would just like to say I am sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus, June 6th, like the movie, big mothership and all. I'll be back, I'll be back. She's hardly... Arnold Schwarzenegger is she? What reality is she living in? And yet they put her to death by lethal injection. As far as I'm concerned, Wernos's abusive upbringing was a tragic, tragic concoction. A situation that was completely beyond her control. And when I've looked at the death row situation in the United States, often, Often, those being put to death have experienced tragic, tragic backgrounds. And if we refuse to see the pattern of that destruction, if we refuse to acknowledge that this kind of childhood experience can lead to terribly destructive behaviour, then we will never learn. If all we want to do is suggest that somebody who kills is evil, and therefore deserving of the death penalty or being locked up for the rest of their lives, then there is no potential to understand how we can prevent killers becoming killers. If we were able to take a step back and to see that so many people have been so badly abused that at some point in their life, they decide that they will no longer be a victim and that plays out in catastrophic ways as 
I believe in this case with Eileen Wernos, it indeed did, then how will we ever learn to intervene? It's too simple to say that one is good and one is evil. The truth is that it lies somewhere in between. And when we accept that, maybe we really will have the power to stop children being so broken that in the end they grow into humans who break others. I'm not expecting that you all feel sympathetic towards Eileen Wernos. She was a serial killer and she did terrible things. But I think we have to acknowledge that she wasn't sane when they killed her and her story could have been a very different outcome had the system and those who should have cared for her intervened at times where she could have been helped. Who knows, I might be wrong and that's okay. That's YouTube. I hope you've enjoyed my conversation around this. I hope you've learned a few things. I hope maybe I've shifted a few of your perceptions or maybe I've just confirmed them. Either way, I would love to know. Please do comment, share, let me know what you think. It really helps. And remember, if you have not subscribed, please do because you'll get told every single Sunday when I'm on and you'll be able to catch up with more true crime with Emma Kenny. 